Welcome to the Path of Zen. My name is Mark. In this video, I'm just going to answer a few questions that um, I get asked all the time. So the first one is, what is Zen? And often the most simplest answer suffices, which is, Zen is you communing with the Buddhic light. Some people also call that Buddha nature. That's the short and sweet answer. Um, the next question is, when do we, what do we know about Zen and where did it come from? I think Zen is summed up in the four mottos of Zen, which goes like this. Uh, special transmission outside of doctrine, not established in language or culture or country. Uh, directly pointing to um, Sita, it's sometimes translated as mind, but that's incorrect. Sita is more of um, kind of the, the spirit. And seeing into one's Buddha nature and attaining Buddhahood, which is basically saying you're, it's already there. Buddha nature, Buddha, Buddhic light, Buddhahood, is, it's already there. And by your communing into the the Buddha nature of the Buddhic light, you have a shot into becoming Buddha. So that's basically where did it come from, and what do we know about Zen? Um, as to how those are translated and ported into different languages and cultures and people and customs. I think it's just all unique. Um, how Chan is in China and then how it got ported into Japan is is unique. I mean, Japan is a very um, more militaristic. Um, so the way that Zen was kind of portrayed in Japan was in a very high ceremonial a heavily ritualistic and militaristic um, presentation. So, you know, something like dhyana, which it's not a physical posture or physical um, um, thing that you do. It's more of a um, state, uh, um, what you, kind of what you do with your mind or your, your spirit. Um, in Japan, it's just basically translated into a high ceremony. Uh, with heavy ritual and rites. And they created a ecclesiastical church around uh, this entire idea of, you know, the, the, four, the four mottos of Zen. And in with that, um, you have an institution. And so this kind of comes to the next question of, well, then what is the Zen master? And some people would point that the Zen master is somebody that comes from these institutions. But that's not really um, often the case because you can a lot of times meet somebody from these institutions and they're actually quite ignorant as to what Zen is. They, they point to the robes and the, the bibs that they wear and the special haircuts and the, um, the ceremonies and the halls and the temples, and they'll tell you that that is Zen. Um, some other people will say, well, Zen is sitting on a cushion. Um, um, other people will say, well, Zen is meditation. And these are all physical posture and materialistic notions of what Zen is. And it's sort of like, well, that's ecclesiastical. That's the formations, the form of what they think Zen is. It's like they think the, the body is in the skanda is this, what makes up you is Zen. And that's, that's kind of not it. I mean, um, so what is a Zen master? Well, it's somebody that can lead you, lead you or dispel ignorance and um, the, the delusions that you have in your own mind about yourself. To, to see the, the Buddhic light that is already there, to see Buddha nature, and to commune with it. Because once the student communes with Buddha nature, that kind of becomes their teacher. There's, there's, nothing, there's no more instruction is really needed. And 
you'll hear that often echoed in the Zen masters of old China, that, you know, instruction is complete. And it's also something that you hear in the Heart Sutra, which is once, once you've accessed the divine Buddhic nature, everything is done. All instruction is complete. Nothing more needs to be said. Because the, fir- the more that a person communes and kind of just gets in really deep with the Buddha nature and the Buddhic light, changes come from within to, to without. Um, that's the, that is true spirituality. Those that believe that changes are from the outside to the inside, um, those are the fake it till you make it people. Uh, and those are the most dangerous ones, in, in my humble opinion. Um, so, when did Zen change from being centered in China to kind of being centered in Japan? Um, probably about the 15th century. However, um, Chan in China went through many different phases and many different uh, twists and turns. Um, you know, there was a lot of Taoism and Manichaeanism mixed in with um, with Chan. A lot of emperors had different notions. There was multiple persecutions of Buddhists in, in China and temple burnings. Um, in Japan, uh, when Zen was brought in, um, it was heavily ritualized and uh, ordained in a lot of ceremony. Um, like Zazen is really just Diana in a very high ceremony and uh, filled with rites. It's it's just how a culture interprets these things and how a ecclesiastical order um, exists. They you know it's it's how they define themselves. You know if you want to be a monk, well then you do these things and. It, it's 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 an identity um, for those that need it until they don't need it. So, you know, Japanese Zen has its its purposes and it has its place. Um, though you just have uh, us Westerners just have to realize that Japanese Zen is not about the culture, not about the things Japanese or the Japanese people. Um, it's about the the message, which is you yourself have the Buddhic light within you, and all you have to do is take a moment to go see it. And you know, once you see it, that's the transformation. That's what transforms you. And the more that you become in sync with Buddha nature, with the Buddhic light. Um, the more you will transform. You will transform um, away from being a sentient being into a bodhisattva. So that's um, what, what you know, Zen in Japan kind of became about. Um, however, again, it's, you know, it's all wrapped in a cultural package, you know, how a certain people, a certain culture um, brought it in. And it's not to say that we have to adopt those cultures and to understand Zen. Um, Because, like I said, a Zen master is somebody that already knows the point. They can teach Zen um, independent of any culture or of any particular kind of teaching or language or people. Um, I could teach Zen to Christians in a completely Christian context. Um, using the words Christ and properly defining the words Christ. Christ is not a man. Christ is, spir- is pure spirit. So this this becomes a, you know, that is the mark of, of a Zen master, is somebody that can always point to the spirit, irregardless of culture, time, and, and place, Whereas those that are only involved in the ecclesiastical nature of these uh, organizations, they can't. They could only see Zen in those contexts, and anything outside of that context, they, they, can't, they can't speak to it. They don't know what it is, because they haven't really yet seen their own Buddha nature, their own Buddhic light. They're still looking for it. You know? 
when that happens. So where is Zen today? I think it's where it always has been. Um, you have probably a handful of people that really understand um, what is the point of Zen, what is what Zen really teaches. You have a lot of people that are um, doubtful, who are still, who may have had a hint of the Buddha nature and Buddhic light. And they are, you know, the disciples, and they are really earning, striving hard to um, fall in sync with their Buddhic nature. And you have a lot of people that are also just um, involved in the ecclesiastical orders and the temples of these uh, Zen institutions and these religious orders, which is identity, which is... um, you know, a gang, a religious gang, if you really want to get down to it. So, like I said, where is Zen today? It's it's been where it's always been. Um, it's it's layers within layers within layers, circles within circles within circles. And so the next question is: Well, who claims to represent Zen? Well, Zen represents Zen. It's once you, once anybody um, sees Buddha, once understands or uh, uh, communes with the Buddhic light or Buddhic nature, that is who represents Zen. And they can express that in any, any possible means. You know, a lot of people express it through their own cultural uh, and their own language and their own understanding. It's not to say that oh I un- I I understood Zen and now I have to move to Japan or something like that. That's that would be insane. But um, so who claims to represent Zen? Well, it's anybody who sees and knows and who's in communion, and, you know, in sync with the uh, the Buddhic light, Buddha, Buddha nature. That's who. Um, and this kind of kind of backtracks again to who is a Zen master. Well, it's it's anybody who is in sync and in tune with the Buddha nature. Um, anybody who is uh, progressing into the Bodhisattva path. Because you, you have to first be in sync with your Buddha nature to be on the Bodhisattva path. That's just how that works. Um, so are there any differences between what groups claim what Zen is. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of groups out there. Um, and it's like anything else. It's supposed to, but for example, let's take the um, basketball teams. There's there's hundreds of basketball teams out there. Everything from the amateur to the, um, the local gym to the YMCA to um, college to pro basketball. And every team is going to have their own idea of, you know, how to play the game and more, more morally how to win. So I look at like it like this, you know, a, a Zen center, you know, like I said, you're, you, you, you go to a Zen center, you're, you're kind of joining a gang. Every gang will have its own ways, its own rituals, its own... Um, thing that they do, their own rites, their own oaths, their own special haircuts and the robes that they wear and uh, whatever religious ornaments they want to put on themselves to to be part of that club. And like I said, it's, it's, it's identity. And I think that all these different groups, these different gangs, these different basketball clubs – can teach a person something, you know. I mean, there's there's nothing that says that you can't go from one to the other and, and learn different things. I mean, in old China, monks would constantly go from one teacher to another teacher or this temple to that temple. And it was the same thing in China. But however, in the West, I just get it just boggles my mind that people kind of think that the, the first Zen center they go to is the only Zen center they go to. Or the first teacher they talk to is the only Zen only teacher they will ever talk to, and that's 
I don't know where that came from. That's just some sort of um, wonky thinking, in my opinion. So that's why I, I think that, you know, you should definitely visit different Zen centers, different groups, listen to different teachers, uh, listen to different people, different traditions. You know, I mean, it'd be great to go talk to somebody from the Japanese traditions and then go talk to somebody from the Korean traditions and just get different ideas. Just listen. And, you know, especially if you haven't found the Buddhic light and you're, you you're still kind of doubtful and you're still trying to figure this out, go listen. It can really help you. Mm. Uh, so how does Zen today relate to Zen in the past? Like I said, it's it's not. I don't really see or think that there's much difference. I think the way that Zen is today is pretty much how it's always been. Um, you have a lot of different agendas and different people with at different levels along the the path. Um, everybody, you know, trying to figure this out. Um, I think some people have lost faith and just sort of decided to um, make personal cults out of Zen for themselves. Um, certainly did an interview with a, with a man that fell in a group like that. And uh, I think that some groups have um, given up on Buddhism and become political activist groups. You know, it's, I don't, like I said, I think this has happened all throughout history and time. Um, it's really up to you as the seeker, you know, is, are you getting anything out of these groups? Is it leading you to, is it helping you or not? And if it's helping you, then stay. If it's not helping you, then move on. Find somebody or some group or some teacher that can help you. You know, until you find the, the Buddha nature, the Buddhic light within, and you can commune with it, then, 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 then you know, keep, keep searching. Keep going out there and listening to people. Keep um, keep working at it. For those that have already communed with the Buddhic light and the Buddha nature, then you are the bodhisattvas, and that there you turn around and help the others who are who are striving to yet even see the Buddhic light. So the next question kind of is, uh, how can I study Zen, and how do I start? Um, don't know really. Uh, books. Read a lot of books, watch a lot of videos, um, go to different Zen centers, listen to different teachers, um, try different things. I mean, um, that's how I did it. You know, I, I just went, just, just, just go. There's no reason why. There's nothing. You know, nothing. You're not going to be like pledging to some cult or something like that. That's I have. I don't think I've ever seen that. I mean, most people. They just go to a Zen center for a few weeks or a month or two, and they either say, well, they stick around or they move on. I mean, they could try the meditation. They could do the ceremonies. Um, ceremonies are supposed to be aspirational and supposed to encourage um, vitality and inspiration and for you to keep going and keep striving towards enlightenment. Um you can try, see how it goes. I mean, some people like the cultural stuff, some people don't. Um, different Zen teachers will teach different things and will, um, they, you know, different personalities and different aspects of people and different temperaments. Um, you know, that's why there's so many different teachers and different, different paths, different uh, traditions and different ways of learning Zen. So that's, that's my, what I have to say about that. Uh, where can I find? So the next question is, where can I find good research for some more about Zen? I don't know. Uh, Google, uh, Amazon, are, are good places. Uh, there's a lot of free stuff out there. Um, you can certainly, I mean, there there's probably enough books and literature on Zen to last a person a lifetime. So I don't really think that that's the problem. Um, I really think that. You know, if you really want to learn Zen, go visit different Zen centers. Go listen to different teachers and um, find, you know, maybe you'll find somebody that really speaks to you and really encourages you. And 
Um, or maybe not, you know. I mean, I've listened to a lot of Zen teachers uh, in my time, personally going to their Zen centers and sitting in their in their lectures and had to have, you know, taking a good listen to what they're saying. And some people got it, and I, I, I thought, well, yeah, they, they, they're definitely gelling with the Buddhic light, but they're not really somebody that I felt that I wanted to be uh, associated with, as, as not because they're doing anything bad, because just temperament, different. they had different style, different temperament, and a different uh, ideas, and I just didn't want to do it. Um, others, I think that they were just struggling to even uh, find the Buddhic light, and they were just reading from scriptures most of the time. So you have to go to the Zen centers and decide, you know, and find out for yourself. You know, like I said, yeah, some of these places um, are probably are cults and they are just pers- cults of personality run by certain um, men who are struggling themselves with, with, with understanding what Zen is. And that becomes apparent after a while. Um, and if that's the case, then just leave. Just go find a different Zen center or a different Zen teacher. All right. So what makes Zen so special that people are interested in it? I think that um, Zen really um, became of interest um, mostly because of um, martial arts. I remember during the 70s and 80s, the big, you know, martial arts craze and pretty much anything Japanese (laughs) was kind of, that was cool. So I think Zen kind of followed the the martial arts craze and kind of came into the United States. I think Westerners who, you know, were learning martial arts from these Japanese teachers we're then being told about Japanese Zen. And I think that's kind of how that happened in the West. Um, but today, I think it's just because there's just a lot of mystique and a lot of um, commercialization around Zen. Um, a lot of people say things about Zen that are probably not true. Um, a lot of people claim Zen will help them with their relationships and their relaxation and their coping with stress and stuff like that. And that's not really what, that's not really what Zen is about, but it gets people to go, maybe to go and try meditation or something. It's a step. And I I don't have a problem with that. I mean, um, it's just a step, a, a door that people can at least enter. That's probably, you know, not non-committal, you know, you're not, doesn't look like you're joining some crazy cult or something like that. And that's, I think that's just a very casual way that people can, can understand Zen. So again, um, here's another question is, um, what is Zen study? What is the point? Well, the point is to see, you know, to see and fall in sync with the Buddhic light, to completely understand buddhic nature uh, and that in turn reveals ultimate reality and uh, I, like I said in one uh, video that I just did that um, most people think that the world around them illuminates to them and that you know the objects themselves are you know or, 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 you know, it's like the hat tells you it's the hat. The hat illuminates into your mind that it's the hat. But really when, you know, when the Zen student starts to really look at it, they, they like I said, they're in a dark room and they're looking around and there's a light source, but they can't see the light source because it's behind their head. It's behind them. And when they look around in any direction, they can see the objects in the room. They can see the the chairs and whatnot, but they can't see the source of illumination. So they just assume that those objects themselves are illuminating to them. Um, you know, it's it's the that each one is independent. You know, that the chair is independent of the desk, and the desk is independent of the computer, and that they all illuminate into my mind as to what they are. 
But in the reality is, it's the Buddhic light that shines onto these objects and illuminates them. And this is, you know, and that the light is all the same. And it's just the, the, the way, and that is, it's the mind that creates the delusion of all this. And even your body is illuminated by the light. You know, it creates the, 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 the illusion of, of the skandhas that are in front of you. That are you. So this is the um, the thing about Zen. It's it asks you to take the backward step or to turn around. You'll hear things like that in Zen, which is um, take the backward step, um, turning words. Um, a lot of koans are designed to get you to turn around and look at the Buddhic light. It's you know like. I forget the one where the master hands the uh, candle to the student and the student grabs it and the master blows it out. And it's these are statements about, you know, that, that turning around and looking at the true origination of the light source, of, of what is illuminating what. And then once you see that, then that becomes, um, that becomes the teacher. That becomes the Zen master. That becomes... Uh, everything that you that, that completes the teaching, um, and there you kind of graduate. You're kind of now on the bodhisattva path because you're in a path of transformation. And I was just to say a few more words on that. Once you enter the bodhisattva path, um, you will start to see like things like, oh yeah, these actions really create suffering, <laughs> or these actions are creating some. Some karma. I think I'll just stop doing those actions, and it's a natural change coming from the inside, and it trend and it goes to the outside. And that's the transformation. Nobody has to tell you these changes. You don't study these changes. It's natural. It's based on, it's based upon observation of what is right in front of you. It's like, oh hey, I think I'll just stop behaving this way, or I think I'll stop doing these things. And so you change. And this is, um, like I said, that's, that's the teacher. You, you, you're on the bodhisattva path. Instruction is all complete. And you know now you're just really starting to relinquish. You're starting to um, abandon. And you're starting to renounce everything that's creating suffering for yourself and those around you. Um, and the more that you follow the bodhisattva path, the more that you kind of fall deeper and deeper and deeper in sync with the Buddhic nature. Um, and it gets pretty, sometimes it can get pretty spooky and sometimes it can get pretty mystical of, of where this goes. But you're kind of, you're kind of beyond the Zen center at this point. And, you know, most, peop most people that are on the bodhisattva path you know they they can kind of tell you like yeah you're you're beyond zazen you know <laughs> you're kind of you're kind of you know you're beyond instruction you no longer it's not that you no longer need to go to the zen center if you want to go then go if you don't want to go then don't go it's the fact is is that you don't need them you don't need the gang you don't need the identity you don't need the um, the rites and the rituals anymore and that's that was just um, preliminary stuff. You know, it was like it was. It was to get you to. It was to, to bring faith. But once you, once the faith has come, you don't need the preliminaries. You know, you don't need the step ladder, because you're already on the 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 the, the, to the top shelf. You know, it's, or how the Buddha say it, you don't need to keep carrying the boat with you when you're on the other shore. So, what is the benefit to study Zen? Will I get anything out of it? Mm. The benefit is your own spiritual salvation, um, escaping the cycle of rebirth, you know, on the bodies off a path. Will you get anything out of it? Your own freedom. Um, the next question is, is it hard to study? Depends on you, your intention, your motivation, your, your own disposition and your own temperament um you know if you're tired of 
the hamster wheel of samsara, you know, coming back, coming back, coming back. You know, it's what I call the game of wombs. Because what happens when you die? It's another womb. Um, yeah, it just depends on you. You know, if not if not this lifetime, then maybe the next lifetime, you know, or many down the road. Um, uh, what is enlightenment in Zen? I kind of already covered that. The word itself is, you know, enlightenment. It's enlightening your yourself the the, the the light within it's that's the secret the word tells you what zen is what the point is so what is enlightenment it's the light within it's the buddhic light the the, the buddha nature and it's really coming into sync into um, sympathy into um communion with it that's all it is um once you do this then you're the bodhisattva and um, you're you're kind of off on your own. Um, can I? Next question is: Can I get enlightened? Yes. Um, I think there's a lot of mystique and um, Hollywoodization of of enlightenment. I think a lot of people try to try to. I think a lot of people who don't know, who are not Buddhist, who are ignorant. They try to make enlightenment seem like godhood or something like that, and that's that's not what enlightened uh, enlightenment is. Um, it's, it's it's like I told you, it's very simple. It's just being in sync with with the Buddhic light. Um, are you or anyone you know enlightened? Uh, I would say that there are people that I know that are definitely in sync with their inner light, who are well on their way on the bodhisattva path and um, definitely uh, <laughs> there's they definitely um, very well know how to how and they can very well teach how to become in sync with the buddhic light how you can see it uh, and they say it in their own way in their own culture they're not using anything asian or japanesey so yes, I do believe and I do know that people can become enlightened. Um, how does Zen relate to Buddhism? Well, Zen is Buddhism. It's um, the core of the Buddhist teaching is to be in sympathy and sync and communion with the Buddhic light, and um, you know the transcendent, the the priorness before your thought. Um, you know the, the 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 intuitive knowing, so yeah, it, it's it, how does it relate to it? Well, it is Buddhism. Let's just get right to it. Uh, who is the Buddha in the Zen tradition? Um, the Buddha in the Zen tradition is. It's not really. I mean, people think well, Shakyamuni. Well, no, that's that's more of the story. The Buddha is the transcendent in such a way in this materialistic, dualistic world that we can understand it. So that's why when we say, well, the Buddha, we're not saying Shakyamuni from 2,500 years ago. What we are really talking about is the the pure spirit, the pure transcendent spirit that is innate in all sentient beings. And you and I are sentient beings. Your thoughts are sentient beings. This um, is what we, in, in Buddhism, this is what we're referring to. Not the man, not some flesh and body person, you know. And we are not... This is why in, 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 in Zen, it is this is why they call it a living tradition. We're not praying to dead people. Um, we're not, we, we are within the living spirit itself. We are communing with the Buddhic spirit, the Buddhic light right now. Not, not, not praying to some event that happened 2,500 years ago. 
So this is a um, a uh, something that you know a lot of Christians can identify this because well they say well I pray to the I pray to the Christ the Christ right now. Well yeah they, that is the pure spirit, and it's really no different in the Zen tradition. You know you're you're you are communing with the pure spirit right now. Um, what are koans? Koans are just um, mind puzzles or um, um, cases in which there's no conceptual or logical answer. You you really it's about turning to the Buddhic light and um, seeing the Buddhic light, which again it's it's outside of scripture. It's outside of um, you know, outside of the traditions, so to speak, it's not something that somebody could just hand to you. So the, the the koans, and I don't really think that koans is a good fit for for Western students, um, because koans are were really meant to be, um, like I said, sort of a, a sort of a, a way to get somebody to abandon conceptual thinking, the plotting, the scheming. Um, you know, I'm going to, you know, oh, I know what Buddhism is, like a test sort of answer, you know, a memorization of, of scriptures and stuff like that. Um, and this kind of comes again, I think, because, you know, koans came, came about because a lot of, a lot of people came from, a lot of monks were, came in from traditions where memorization of sutras or litanies was what they did and so when somebody would say well, well what did the buddha teach and they just go recite a litany um koans was meant to kind of kind of disrupt that like i said i don't really think it really works with with westerners um or maybe some it just depends again try it out go go find a teacher that works with koans and go try it out um, you know, I guess a, a teacher is just somebody that's knowledgeable in these areas. It doesn't mean they're enlightened or they have to be enlightened or they, it's just somebody that you can work with that isn't going to harm you. You know, I mean, if you think the person's going to harm you, then don't, don't go visit that person or at least don't stick around. Um, but, but go try. The next question is, I've heard meditating is a part of Zen. How do I meditate to to study this? So, Zen meditation is really giving up your preconceived mental thoughts about what 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 is Zen, what is yourself, what is religion, uh, all that stuff. So it's really Di- Di- Diana in which you are relinquishing, renouncing, and abandoning all concepts of what you think this world is. And it's kind of a funny thing happens um, when you just let go. Um, and you just trust yourself, the intuitive self of your, you know, your, your, the, the, just the, your intuition. Um, like for me... I would see everything start to brighten up as if there's a huge light um, around me coming like just from over from the back of my head to over my head. And I knew that this light was the Buddhic light. You can't really look right at it because then it would be an object, but it's it's but you you know it, it's the but everything suddenly becomes apparent that the entire phenomenal existence and your your body, even your thoughts, um, are all illuminated by this light. And that those are all illusional. You know, it's like a hologram. The hologram is just light. Light interacting with particles of matter light interacting with other light, a light interacting with waves and um, things like that. I mean, I think there was a, somebody did a concert uh, a few weeks ago and where 
uh, it was like holographic on a stage where they were just shining uh, laser lights at a um, fog cloud uh, particles and it looked real people people were like wow i mean is it real or they they were but they were playing from a different location so i think that's kind of what meditating is it's you're 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 in a deep state of diana um you've relinquished renounced abandon um, all things that you think is yourself and, and Zen and whatnot, and you are trusting. You put complete faith and trust in the intuitive, into this intuitive mind, the intuitive soul, if you really want to get down to it. And thus the light becomes apparent. You see the light, and you say, my gosh, something is illuminating. Something is illuminating everything in my body, my the, the zendo, the wall, the cushions I'm sitting on, they're all holograms. They're all illusionary. They've never existed. And that's what meditation, or at least what Zen meditation is supposed to be. And then once you fall in sync with the light, you get commune with the light, you turn around. You turn around and you embrace the light. You turn around and you accept it. You turn around and you fall in fall into it and this is the transformation you you know enters the student out comes the bodhisattva and that's what zen is aiming at so um you know zen meditation is is the is this transformation and the more that you do this you turn to the light turn to the light turn to the light the deeper and deeper and deeper you go, um, and the transformation becomes absolute and permanent. Um, and then you you're really are just deeper and deeper and deeper on the bodhisattva path. The, 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 the teacher has long gone. Whatever Roshi or Zen teacher you started with, that's history. That's gone. The Zen center, if, you know, if you're invited, you can stick around. If not, move on. Um, so that's, you know, that's what Zen meditation is. Um, it could be casual. It could be anything from just taking a walk to laying down to, you know, you, you, I've heard runners even say that they've had moments like that where they feel that they're just running on light, that there's light all around them. So it has nothing to do with body position. It has nothing to do with uh, any particular incantations or rituals or anything like that. I mean, the Japanese have made a very high ceremonial um, and and rites out of out of this. You know, they call it zazen, which is just high ceremony, which is fine. Um, you just have to know this that it's high ceremony. That's all it is. It's a it's a ceremonial ritual performance that you're engaging in. And like I said, as long as you know this, it's fine. You can, it's like, as long as you're saying, well, that's just a, a Japanese view of this, but it could be casual. I mean, you can sit down and in, in, in front of your morning coffee and have a moment of, of Zen meditation. It, it doesn't matter. Sometimes, Sometimes it just doesn't stop. Sometimes the buddhic light is uh, carries with you, and that's really when you know um, things are changing. Is when you found you know the Buddha, you you you've really got in communion with the buddhic light, and it stays with you and through all things you're doing, and you're seeing it everywhere when you drive, when you work, when with your with your family. It's it's just everywhere. Um, and that's how that works. So uh, the next question is, is there any um, special meditation associated with Zen? Uh, I just went with that with the, uh, it's, yeah, it's, it's really turning to the buddhic light and transformation. Uh, will enlightenment help me see things differently or access higher planes of existence? Uh, will I gain any powers? Uh, yes. Um, most people that are enlightened transform. They just stop doing things that create 
suffering. Um, accessing higher planes of existence, sure. But you're always snapped back to this this mortal body, just giving you heads up on that one. Um, so you, you kind of see the entire um, Dharmakaya, the, the entire plane of it. And you can go, you know, yeah, sure, God realms, hell realms, doesn't matter. But you're always going to snap back to this body because this is... This is where the 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 mind is. You're you're not gonna be like trans leaving this body to another body. You're not gonna be um in a different body. Um, the only way that you do that is that is death. And if you haven't released yourself, if you haven't found your freedom in this life, then you're just gonna end up in another womb. And that and that's all gonna depend on on uh, what sort of attachments you have. So, um, will I gain any kind of powers? Probably. Um, I've seen quite a bit. Everything from um, people uh, levitating to people seeing the future, seeing the past, seeing things happening in different parts of the world. Um, they call that remote viewing in the more um, scientific um, aspects of, of looking at different kinds of mental powers. Um, I've seen people bend reality. I've seen people. I've seen objects fly across the room. I've seen um, heavy statues tip over. So yeah, um, all kinds of powers can happen. Um, that's not really the point of of Zen, but it does happen, and it's something that. Um, every individual deals with in their own way, and sometimes schools have um, teachers or they have people that can help people that are suddenly um, bending reality. Um, so, okay, next question is, is, what is meant by karma, the cycle of rebirth in the Zen tradition? Um, karma is, in, in my humble opinion, the emotional stake that you, you know, your stake holding on um, experiences, you, you've, you've made an investment into something emotionally, and um, that's karma. The cycle of rebirth, um, it's the game of wombs, as I like to call it. Um, you're, when you die, you, you die right into another womb. Um, it's endless. It's the hamster wheel. And in the Zen tradition, you are leaving, you are exiting, you are leaving the cycle. Um, that's all I'll say about that. Are there any living Zen masters today? Uh, yes. There are many out there. Um, does Zen teach anything about the soul? Yes. It's uh, Sita, Manas. Um, because if you say there's no soul, then what, what is reborn? You know, this, is, this becomes a, a, a question of, um, you know, if, if, if you say there's no soul, then you're saying there's no rebirth. And if there's no rebirth, then what is Zen? There's what is the Buddhic light? There's 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 no point. So yes, there is a soul. It's not the Christian definition of a soul. Christians believe that a soul is eternal and that it's either going to live with God forever or be annihilated. And Buddhism does not believe that the soul will will be is will, will is eternal, as in it'll eternally be in one place. And the soul migrates. But eventually, when the soul leaves the cycle of rebirth, um, that is a you know you're 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 going beyond. To I can't the human language is I mean we're too I'm too limited you know this human brain human mind human understanding is extremely limited. So in in that, 
um, we just we just leave it there, which is the answer is yes. Um, and then lastly, um, what is Zen doctrine? Which it's all all again, no matter you know from the sutras to the Zen masters of old to current teachings, it's all about turning to the Buddhic light and kind of falling into communion with it and the transformation into the Bodhisattva. That's it. It's different for everybody, and how it manifests and how it comes is all different depending on the times and, um, you know, your country of origin, what, your language, your, your culture. Um, so a bodhisattva, though they will have the same characteristics and the same um, goals, how that actually appears is all relative. It's all relative to who you are in the community you're in. Um, does Zen have any ritual components? Yeah. You can have rituals and rites. It doesn't hurt anything, but it doesn't change anything. If you want to have aspirational ceremonies, um, if you want to ask the great Mahasafa Bodhisattvas for help, that's fine. I mean, these are... Um, Transcendent bodhisattvas of great um, convictions and great vows that um, are there. And if you want to ask for help and for, for assistance, go, go, go for it. If you don't, you don't have to ask. There's nothing that says you have to. But a lot of Zen rituals um, depend that you have faith in those things. And the, the ceremonies and the, the rituals and the rites, um, it's really your own faith, your own belief. If you have faith and belief, then do those things. If you do not have faith and belief, then don't do those things. Um, that's my own opinion. If you want to ask the Bodhisattvas, the Mahasafas, to intervene to, to help people, who are in suffering, you can ask. You can make offerings. But it doesn't change anything about your own path on the, your own path. You still are communing with the Buddhic light. Um, does Zen make any moral, personal, or ethical demands like the Ten Commandments? So... There's this, again, the fake it till you make it. Um, it's the imposing in light. So it's like people who are on the Bodhisattva path, and um, they naturally stop doing things that create suffering and harm and uh, to themselves and others. But for those that are not yet on the Bodhisattva paths, who have yet to see the Buddhic light and, call, and, and come into communion with it, they can ask the Bodhisattva, oh, how can I, how can I walk the path? And the, the, the Bodhisattva can say, well, you just stop doing dumb things. You stop doing things that hurt other people. And thus you have the you know the the five the precepts you know the five precepts is the most common uh, you know well hey like not killing people is is a good idea uh, you know don't lie don't steal don't don't sell them things that are gonna make them woozy and lose their mind like drugs and alcohol and stuff like that and um, don't 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 covet their wives or, or do things or, you know, that are going to piss them off. Um, things like that. So in, in that regards, um, those are what I call you're imposing from the outside, hoping that it'll change the inside, which it, it doesn't really work that way. But it's, it's like, well, in, in the mind of a bodhisattva, one can say that it's like, well, if, if we can make the world a, a better place, more conducive for people to find the Buddhic light, then these are good ideas. And that's about as far as any ethical um, demands like a Ten Commandments or a <clears throat> moral and personal um, 
positions of a Zen organization. So the next question is, is Zen a religion? And the answer is yes, because any time that you are speaking of a, of a transcendent, a, tr a Buddhic light or Buddhic nature, which is all transcendent, that immediately becomes a religion, a religious tenet, um, articles of faith, uh, everything, you know, Mahasafa Bodhisattvas, a transformation, uh, living Bodhisattvas, living Zen masters, that's all religion, that's all transformation, that's all, um, that's all religion. And anybody who says, well, Zen is not a religion, then to them, Zen is what then? It's, it's, it's a club? Is it, is, it, is it a gang? Is it, is it just hanging out and, and wearing, ro you know, wearing robes and holy ornaments and shaving your head? Then what, what, what are we talking about here? So, you know, those are those are questions that I would be asking somebody who says Zen is not a religion. Is then then what are you doing? You know, it's you know my my observation is is those that say Zen is not a religion, they're just creating a gang for themselves for some other purposes. You know, um, it could be personal power, it could be um, some financial thing they're into, and maybe they're selling. Um, you know, life coaching, uh, I don't know. I mean, a lot of times these things end up as um, kind of cults of personality and where what they're teaching is has nothing to do with Zen at all. Um, the last question is, is Zen compatible with, um, oh no, it's, the last question is, is God compatible with Zen and Buddha? So Buddhism recognizes that there are gods, um, absolutely, 100% says, yes, there are gods. But Buddhism does not rely on the gods. We don't rely on the gods as a source of enlightenment or a source of practice or a source of um, walking our path. A person can pray to the gods to clear obstacles or to make events more conducive and easier to, to hear and, and commune with the, with the Buddhic light if they want to. So, is God compatible? You know, the Christian God is the transcendent spirit. Um, Jesus is considered the Christ, which would be the pure spirit that is recognizable within our phenomenal illusionary existence and so yeah you can certainly have a, a zen buddha christ god it all depends on how you want to look at that um you know it the the biblical god and the biblical uh, abrahamic religion is incompatible with zen and buddhism because it believes in eternity and annihilationism, that you, you pray to the avatar, the Christ, the, the Jesus, um, and, that he, and through that you'll be taken to, to the promised land, the pure land, heaven, um, which we see that in pure land Buddhism, which is, which is um, literally, you could just, drag it right over into Christianity, or at least today's Christianity. So in this, you have a, um, you have a parallel. But the Christians teach that once you go to the Christian pure land, it's, it's, you're, you are eternally there, which differs from the pure land of Amitabha, in which you are taken from this world to Amitabha's pure land, in where you can learn and hear the Dharma and escape the cycle of rebirth. So there's like, it's it's a bit different. You're not eternally in Amitabha's pure world. You're not eternally in heaven. And and honestly, a Buddhist would would you know a, a real true Buddhist who has turned to the Buddhic light and is in communion. Would, would see the Christian heaven 
as, well, yeah, you can go there, and it's probably nice. But again, the suffering would eventually come in. And it would start to look like, well, where you're at right now. You think about that for a little while. So Buddhism comes up, and you know the, the Buddha already says, well, you already are here in the pure land. It's just that it, there is the, the defilements and the corruptions and the doubts um, that have lingered in that have you know, kind of kicked up a lot of dust. So you tell me if, what, what all that means. In, in, in my view is um, you go to a heaven and you're essentially being reborn, re rebirthed to right back where you're at because it will, all heavens will degenerate. All gods will die. That's inevitable. So this idea that something is eternal is rejected by Buddhism because this, this thought of eternity only creates suffering because, honestly, it would be like saying you're internally going to prison, which could sound great for the first, until you get tired of it, until it becomes, you start to doubt well, I'm in heaven and I'm with God. I'm with pure spirit. Is there, is there anything beyond that? And suddenly, you're, you're kind of back into, the, the, you're into, into this again, into the phenomenal world. So this is where it differs. And um, in this, um, most even the Christians will kind of say, oh yeah, it, Buddhism is a higher path. Because... Even a god dies. The Buddhic light does not, because it's not born. Um, if it doesn't, if it's, if it doesn't, if it's not in the existence, it cannot wither and die. A god is in existence; it can wither and die. So, same thing with a land, a heaven, a, a um, an Amitabha pure world. Um, uh, you know, any of these things will eventually wither and die. They will corrupt. So that's pretty much the end of my talk on um, these kind of questions, or at least my understanding of the questions. I do not claim to have... Um, you may have different understandings, and uh, you're welcome to to comment on those or to, to say what your understandings are. Um, you're, you're welcome to go listen to different people who have different understandings, which is what you should do. I do not claim to be enlightened or... Uh, oh, but there is one more question. So, go back. So, the last question is... or So, there is a, la there is a last, last question, and... That is, is there anything to worry about in the study of Zen? Can Zen be dangerous? So, the really, the only thing to worry about is insincere people. People that will come to Zen or infiltrate Zen centers or will pretend to be somebody they're not. Um, there's a lot of problems that have happened in the history of Western Zen with Zen teachers preying upon students uh, sexually and financially. Um, there's a lot of things that Zen centers can get into that have nothing to do with Zen or the Buddhic light or enlightenment. Um, some teachers in Zen centers don't even teach Enlightenment. They don't even teach these things anymore. Um, so, you know, yeah, I would say that if if you go visit a Zen center and they're not really about the Bodhisattva path and enlightenment and the path of enlightenment, seeking the Buddhic light, 
uh, being one with Buddha nature, it's probably not a Zen center that you want to go to. It's something else. It's a club. It's it's a gang. It's a political party or or political political think tank, or it's just just like I said, just a club, a gang. Probably move on, find another Zen center, find another teacher. Um, so and, and then the question is, can can Zen be be dangerous? Um, I don't think Zen can be dangerous. I think people can be dangerous. And I think that, um, again, people who are insincere, people who are there to make people pay, who are there to hurt other people, you know, the psychopaths that are out there. Because trust me, um, religions attract psychopaths, and psychopaths like to make people hurt. They like to inflict pain. So those people are out there. And you just really have to watch out for them. Um, not be bamboozled by them. Not be um, coerced by them. Um, they'll use you. They'll use you for many things. Um, so you just have to watch out. That's all I got to say about that. So this will end my, my talk on the questions. Um, these are, again, my own understanding. In my own, uh, I guess, my own enlightenment of what these things are. Um, you, of course, could have different understandings, and different people will have different understandings and say things differently. So I always encourage you all to to visit different Zen teachers, Zen centers, um, listen to different people, how they think about these things and what they have to say about it. And in that way, you can, do, you can, for yourself, understand what is the path of Zen and come to turn to the Buddhic light yourself. And when you do that, then that is your teacher. That is your, your path. There is, you, the, your, your Zen training is, is complete. Nothing more needs to be said. And that's what, what we drive to. This, this, is, this is not a... Um, I say this: the Zen is not a a church that you go to, you know, every Sunday because there's something something I have yet to tell you. It's like once you turn to the Buddhic light, you found your teacher. You you are done with Zen centers. So that's my what I have to say. All right. So thank you for listening and bearing with me. Um, and until next time.